Hi, my name is Dr. Erwin Kwan. I am on a mission to dissect what makes high performers, innovators, and great leaders successful. For this podcast, I aim to share insights from interesting and exciting conversation with people who have figured it out to inspire you and empower you with actionable tips you can put into practice to hopefully improve your life. Today I have a special guest, Dr. Mahibar Rahman. He is a portfolio GP, consultant in medical education and medical director of eMedica. We cover a lot of ground in this interview. He shares his insider knowledge how to prepare for professional exams, how to make crucial choices to develop a portfolio career, and how to thrive professionally. He also talks about his passion for cooking and how he uses planning and batching to optimize his family life while striving professionally. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Mahibur Rahman. Welcome Mahibur. I appreciate you making the time to come on the show. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much, Erwin. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to join you. Right. I want to jump in one of your interviews. You said, I had previously been involved in the sea cadets when I was a teenager, so I thought I would enjoy doing medical assessment on an army base. Could you tell us more about your involvement in the sea cadets? One of my neighbors introduced it to me and, uh, you know, he'd been a member for a couple of years and he said, oh, you know, um, I was sort of 11 coming on to 12 at the time. And uh, he said, look, this would be fun. Do you want to come along? So we went along and it, basically Sea Cadets is an organization. There's uh, units all over the country. And uh, so my local one was based in the basement of a local school. And that first day we went there and they had uh, air rifle shooting. And I thought that was really fun. And then, uh, you know, other times we do different physical activities, things like canoeing, orienteering. But it also taught me a lot of really useful skills. Like the first time I started to teach was actually in sea cadets, because as you progress through the cadet ranks, um, the senior ranks have to teach the junior cadets. And so they actually have assessments on teaching. And so uh, that was when I first got introduced to things like leadership, you know, you leading a squad, um, teaching, um, but also uh, it was really stimulating for me because there was a lot of physical things that I previously hadn't been exposed to and probably wouldn't have had the uh, sort of ability to be exposed to had I not been part of cadet. So things like canoeing, uh, power boating, sailing, they weren't things, you know, for someone growing up in, in London um, that... Uh, you know, from a working class family, there weren't things that were easily accessible. But through cadets, I got, you know, I, I got to go on to naval bases, uh, go on ships. Um, uh, so things like that was really fascinating. That's very interesting. So I guess as a teenager, you were quite curious about doing things and exploring. You started early on teaching as well through this organization. Yeah, that, that's right. So um, uh, when I was about 16 and I've been in cadets sort of from age 12 or, or so, to be honest, probably just before that. Um, so you, you go up the ranks and once you get to leading cadet and then cadet petty officer, these are the sort of senior ranks, you you, you know, you start teaching the, the junior cadet. So um, I remember preparing for my assessments and having to prepare a lesson. And then the first time, to be honest, it didn't go really well because I wasn't well prepared. And then, uh, you know, I, I really learned from that the importance of preparation and how much effort goes into um, teaching something well so you know that's carried on now uh, sort of nearly 30 years later um, I'm, I'm teaching as my main job now and probably to prepare an hour's worth of teaching you need to do 10 hours plus of preparation that's very interesting that you highlighted the importance of preparation because most of the work is done in preparation as you highlighted people probably underestimate that and most of the time people do less than they should be doing yeah i think d definitely w one of the things that the more i teach the, the the more i learn is that you know every time i teach i'm learning things from uh, you, you know the doctors and the students that i engage with but that for you to be confident in what you're teaching you need to really know it in depth because it's not a matter of just teaching what's on your slides you know the slides should be minimal they're a, a reminder most of the teaching are things that you're teaching from memory, if you like, but especially when people are going to ask you questions, often, you know, 
someone will ask a question that if you didn't really know the material well and hadn't studied it in a lot more depth and prepared it properly, it'd be really difficult to answer. And, you know, if someone asks you a question early on and you haven't got that depth of knowledge because you haven't done the preparation, it might knock your confidence, but also the audience might not be confident that you actually know what you're talking about when you go on to teach the rest of the session. What is your approach of teaching, Mahibur? I, I try to teach on things that I have uh, knowledge of myself. So, for example, you know, if I'm going to teach on MRCGP CSA, for example, you know, I sat the CSA myself, so I know what it's like to actually sit it. But then I've also done a lot of research afterwards. I've you know talked with examiners. I've read the guidelines inside out, um, learned the marking scheme you know, in a lot of depth, and then talk to lots of trainees, trainers to look at what are the things that people struggle with so that when I'm preparing a session, I can make sure that the things that I'm going to teach are going to be really relevant to the people that are coming so that, you know, we cover not just things that might be um, academic, but things that are going to be practically useful to the audience. So, for example, when I teach a session to trainers, I will adapt the material compared to when I'm teaching registrars, which I do a lot more often. But, you know, we do teach a session for trainers. How can they help their registrars prepare? But also how to help a registrar who's failed CSA and look at in detail and give sort of really useful and valuable feedback that's constructive but critical at the same time. So, you know, the, the things that trainers are going to take from that are going to be slightly different. So, you know, I'll adapt the material and make sure it's practically useful and, and relevant. The other thing is that, I have to make sure just before I teach a session that nothing's changed because guidelines sometimes change, you know, the rules change, the marking scheme change, for example, for CSA a couple of times. And so I have to make sure that I'm fully up to date so that, you know, you give them the most up to date material. Absolutely. And for those people who don't know what CSA is, it's a clinical skills assessment for general practitioners. It's part of the exams that they need to complete. Yeah, absolutely. So it's one of three parts of the membership of the Royal College of General Practitioners, the MRCGP exams. Uh, so the CSA is like a simulated surgery with 13 different cases. And you sit this in your third year, so the final year of GP training. You talk about teaching registrars and teaching trainers, and you do this as part of your medical education work. Can you tell us more about this activity? Yeah, so um, my main role now as part of my portfolio career is the medical director of eMedica. So um, eMedica, we've been running courses. Um, we started really focusing on general practice and started co running courses back in 2005. And we run courses all the way from courses to help people that are applying for GP training to help them prepare for assessments, develop communication and consultation skills through to MRCGP AKT, which is the knowledge based exam that they sit usually in the second or third year of training. The MRCGP CSA, um, you know, GP trainers, career development courses for once they finish their exams and so on. We also teach uh, medical students um, uh, and uh, doctors who are doing the induction and refresher scheme. So maybe they've been out of practice for a couple of years or they did their GP training outside of the UK and are trying to come into the, the, the UK. There's sort of assessments that they have to do, um, clinical situational judgment test, and then also a simulated surgery. So um, my main role at eMedica as the medical director is to develop courses and to teach courses, but I also um, work with the e-learning team to develop uh, e-learning material. So we do webinars, hybrid courses, where we live stream courses. There are people in the room and then people outside in different parts of the country or actually different parts of the world joining us live and interacting and asking questions and the questions are answered live. But also we have some sort of practice questions, practice cases for CSA, for example, uh, you know, as part of our e-learning platform. So I'm involved with the team that uh, develops that, those e-learning materials. Um, and sometimes I'll also go to VTS schemes and deliver teaching sessions. So for example, I'm going uh, to deliver a session on helping the registrars prepare for AKT for a Bedford and Luton VTS soon. And previously I've, I've developed sessions uh, and delivered for uh, some of the VTS schemes in the West Midlands on CSA, on AKT, and also uh, for uh, London, 
uh, on career development and career choices after qualifying. So that's my main role as part of uh, my portfolio career now. I will jump into something before um, talking about the e-learning. I'm curious about how did you actually start eMedica? Yeah, it's a uh, great question, Erwin. Um, so actually, after I completed my house jobs, I considered leaving medicine for a time. And I found that doing the job of a house officer, uh, as probably a lot of people can relate, there's, there's a lot of running around, chasing results. Um, but sometimes it can actually be that you're so involved with these sort of small tasks that often intellectually it's not that stimulating and uh, I, I was getting a little bit fed up and I thought you know what you know maybe I'll, I'll pursue something else and I actually got an offer to to go and teach at a medical school in the West Indies and at the same time um, just before I accepted that offer I saw a master's degree in health informatics running at UCL and I've always been interested in computers and uh, sort of uh, technology and things like that and I thought you know what well, this sounds really interesting and that might be an avenue for me to go into consulting if I'm gonna you know leave medicine that might be a- an option for me but it was quite expensive and you know just finishing my house jobs uh, I didn't really have much money um, so I applied for a scholarship from one of the research councils and I thought if I get the scholarship you know they'll pay for the masters I'll do this if not I've got this teaching job lined up I'll take that and that will help me make that decision because I was interested in both because I also really enjoyed teaching. And I got a full scholarship. And so I went and did this uh, degree in uh, health informatics. And within that, all of the sort of optional modules that I picked were to do with interactive learning technologies, creating educational resources. Um, and, and, and so when I finished that, it sort of taught part of that master's, which was 18 months, the last six months I was doing a dissertation. And I I didn't need to attend anymore. You could just do that wherever. So um, I thought I'll take a full time job. And I took a job at Birmingham St. Mary's Hospice as a medical officer in palliative medicine. And my master's uh, dissertation project was about developing and sort of doing a study on evaluating um, an e-learning package to teach cancer pain management skills to doctors. And during that, I, I took a full time job in the hospice to pay my way, if you like. But I fell back in love with medicine. Um, and, and so I finished my master's. I developed the project. But I thought, you know what? I don't want to give up on medicine. I, I really fell back in love with it. So I thought, what can I do that I can still keep some of my interests like teaching, like e-learning, um, health informatics, but also do clinical medicine? I thought GP would be a good fit for that. So I applied for GP training. And during my registrar year, um, I sort of developed, uh, I thought I'll use some of those skills I learned from my degree. I developed a website to give sort of free educational resources for how to get into GP training. It was called gpvts.info and that was recently relaunched as gptraining.info. So it's just a completely free website, just got lots of free articles, um, uh, you know, useful things for people who are interested in general practice about exams to get in about membership about career options and it's just a way to use some of the skills about for example developing educational material to actually put them into practical use so i didn't lose my skills for my masters so that's how i got started in e-learning really. that's very interesting did you find a gap in the market or a uh, a demand for people wanting to know more about the vts training it, it actually came more from my own experience so when i was applying for gp training there really wasn't much information out there. So this is going back a long time ago. So I applied to GP training, I, or I started GP training in 2004. I did my training from 2004 to 2007 um, as part of the Neath Port Talbot VTS in, in South Wales. And at that time, the national assessments had just been recently introduced. There was really not much information on, on the web about it. And everyone I asked sent me to someone else. So for example, I, I contacted what was called the national recruitment office for general practice and i said oh, i want some more information about this and they said oh um contact the royal college and, and i contacted the royal college and they said oh contact the deanery and the deanery said go to the national recruitment office and i was just being sent in circles and i thought i can't be the only person that's finding it difficult to access the information and for example the assessments were all new so you know the kind of 
what's called the specialty recruitment assessment now, where there's a clinical paper and an SJT. That didn't exist in this form. In those days, there was um, a clinical paper, but it had true-false questions, whereas now those are gone. They have uh, single best answers and multiple best answers. And there was no situational judgment testing in those days. There was an essay-type paper. So there really wasn't sort of sample material. If people wanted to practice, there was nothing there. So I thought, you know what, I'll put together all the information that I would have found helpful in one place for other people. And I found that hundreds of people were using this. So, and it was all completely free and it still remains completely free to access gptraining.info. You know, all the articles are free to access. You don't need to register, nothing. It's just there to make it easy for people that are interested in general practice, whether it's applying or it's membership or it's careers, just to put the information out there. But from that, so many people were asking questions and I was sort of doing my training and then I was answering all these questions in my spare time. You know, so many people were asking these questions. I thought, well, maybe people would be interested if we ran a course on it. And that's how the very first course came about is that, you know, we ran a course to, if you like, all of the questions and all of the different things that people could find, but it might take them several weeks or months of research to find, to put it all together and package it into a one day course of you know, how to get into GP training and of some of the skills that you need, communication and consultation skills, and to make it easy, if you like. And that's that's how it all started, basically. It's very interesting to see that as somebody who struggled through uh, the new change, you actually developed something out of it, and that has benefited many people after you. And from there, you also identified how to give more value to other people by developing this one-day course. As doctors, I think it can be very difficult to actually take initiative and do something aside from medicine. How did you find this uh, new challenge? Yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right that it's, you know, so much effort goes into and there's so much work in our normal day jobs. Sometimes, you know, some, sometimes some doctors might be interested in other things, but it's just they haven't got the time or the energy. And I think I was really fortunate in that at the time that all of this was starting, uh, I, I wasn't married. I was uh, living quite far from my family because my, my family are based in London. And then I went to train in Neathport Talbot. So, you know, I, I didn't have, you know, all of my family where, you know, if they were near me, perhaps, you know, I'd spend my evenings there. So I had a lot of free time when I was just starting there. And so, you know, a, a lot of my spare time, I could develop all of these things. Um, and I think the other thing that I, I suppose helped me is that I've always had more than one job, um, pretty much since I was a teenager. Um, so, you know, during university, for example, I, I worked as a waiter during the weekends to pay my bills. And then in the summer holidays, uh, I used to work as a, a social worker um, to build up enough funds to pay for the next year. Um, I, I worked the, the Easter holidays and, you know, Christmas holidays, you know, I, I'd have side jobs to, again, just, you know, help pay my way during um, the, the next term, basically. So I think it came quite naturally to me to think about other things that I could do. Um, because when you're doing all these different jobs, you you, know, you, you see that, that it's, one of the things that I found is that there's the clinical work that you do, but when you're doing some of these other jobs, you know, meeting different doctors, it's so fascinating. You know, I love meeting different people and I'm only where I am because so many people helped me along the way. And I think it's really a great feeling when I see someone who maybe has struggled with the exams, you know, sometimes there might be someone who's on their last attempt of AKT or CSA. And if you can sort of help them through and make a breakthrough and then they get through and you can help them develop their career, you know, it's such a rewarding thing. And, uh, you know, over the years, uh, all the emails and letters and, and, and things that I've had from these people, that the things that, you know, make you stay passionate and, and you know, want to keep going on and, and, and keep being involved in this because it, it's, it's such a great thing. But the other thing is that every time you teach, you learn something. You know, I'm always learning things from the doctors and the students that I engage with, the, the trainers. Um, and, and so I think it's great because it, it gives me energy and I think that doing the teaching gives me the energy to do well in my clinical job and vice versa. I think that's one of the really nice things about a portfolio career is, you know, they say a change is as good as a rest. That, you know, if I was full time um, doing, say, nine clinical sessions, I'm, I might burn out. But equally, teaching is really intense. And, you know, if I was to try and teach five days a week, every week, 
there are some times when I do end up teaching five days a week. It's not uh, often, but you know, to sustain that year round, uh, it's draining. Um, but because I do have that mixture, you know, I really look forward to my clinical days. I, I really look forward when I'm, you know, in clinic to my teaching days and vice versa. I think having this variety as a portfolio GP gives you a broader perspective of your career and each activity that you do actually reinforces the other activity and you still have this thrill of going to work. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I wake up every day really looking forward to going to work. And, you know, they say that uh, if you find a job that you love and, uh, you know, it's still physically demanding, but you don't feel tired, you don't feel fed up, you don't think, oh, Monday's coming around. I look forward to, you know, going to work uh, because, you know, just as a change is a, as good as a rest, also, like you said, variety is the spice of life. Like, so it, it keeps you excited, it keeps you interested. And, you know, doing different things and having to keep on top of different things, it means that you're always intellectually stimulated. You know, I've always got to give, keep reading, but I've also got to keep my clinical skills up and my communication skills up to engage well with patients, uh, to engage well, you know, I, I've got to keep up to date with my teaching skills, all, all of these different things. You know, it, it keeps you interested, it keeps you excited. And, you know, I really look forward to going to work, whichever setting it's in. You're very prominent on keeping things up to date, making sure that you have the most relevant information for people to teach and how this actually impacts on your clinical work. I want to ask you, how do you plan your week ahead? I, I have to plan a bit broader than a week at a time um, because I've got so many different roles and I, I'm constantly juggling them. And then, you know, we've also got two young kids. Um, so I've got to think about things like the school run, which I sort of alternate with my wife. Um, so there's, if you like, there's a daily planning, there's a week ahead planning, but then we also have to plan sort of month, three months, and sometimes some, some things a year ahead. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, there'll be planning as to who's going to do the school run. And then based on that, you know, if I've got clinic that day or I haven't got clinic, if I've got a patient that I'm going to go and assess uh, because one of my portfolio roles, I cover a community detox unit. So, you know, we'll have patients coming in at different times of the week. Um, whether I've got some of my other non-clinical roles, like, for example, I'm, I'm a, an associate examiner for the GMC for the PLAB exam. So there's certain dates where I have to go to Manchester to, to examine. Um, so, you know, I, I need to plan, if you like, what's happening. So on a day-to-day -day basis, there might be, okay, I've got to drop off the kids. I've got clinic in the morning. I might have meetings in the afternoon. I've got to go into the office after that to maybe liaise with the e-learning team. Sometimes we'll do some remote meetings um, uh, and things like that. So there's, if you like, a day-to-day -day planning. And then to try to plan around that some quality time with the family. So like I try to keep my evenings free. You know, we try to eat dinner together as a family. I enjoy cooking. So, you know, if I can plan some time to fit that in some days of the week, that's nice. Then there's the, the bigger plannings. For example, you know, month to month, I'll have a calendar of when I'm teaching, which courses, when my partner at the practice, when he might be off, and then I have to cover additional clinical duties on top of my regular work um, and vice versa. And then we plan around the academic calendar because when there's exams like the AKT, CSA, the specialty recruitment assessment, the GP stage three assessment, we might be running courses based around those. So we've got to plan those sort of six months plus ahead. And then sometimes I'll plan a year ahead. So for example, um, in August, I'm going to go to Bangladesh to do some humanitarian work. Um, I'm going to deploy with doctors worldwide uh, to uh, Cox Bazaar, where you know, the refugee camps dealing with the influx of people from the Rohingya minority. Um, uh, you know, a lot of these refugee camps are based there. So I'm going to go work on a project where I'll be helping to do some training for the local Bangladeshi doctors to ho hopefully, uh, you know, develop something that's sustainable, but also to be involved in clinic and, you know, go and see patients. Um, so I have to plan my leave to fit around that and plan courses. So I'll be doing a course like a couple of days before I fly out. And then when I come back, um, I'll have to make up my clinical duties because someone will have covered me while I'm away. And also I'll have a course 
probably a couple of days after I come back. So I got you know plan around. So things like that, you might have to plan a year out in advance to to fit it all in. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of planning um, when you're a portfolio GP, I suppose. Looking back at your journey, what are the meta skills that you believe are important to be a successful portfolio GP? I think definitely you need to be organized. And you, so you need to be able to plan. So, you know, in amongst all of these roles, one of the things that could happen is if someone gets involved in multiple portfolio roles, it could be very easy to be so tied up with those things that you don't have time to keep up to date yourself because you're so busy doing the actual work. So you've got to plan, you know, things like study leave, you've got to plan conferences you want to go to, to meet other people who, uh, you know, other educators, for example, so that you, you can keep up to date with research and, and things that are happening and, and new ways of teaching and learn new skills for yourself. Um, time to learn for example, we started doing webinars and live streaming courses. I had to learn the technology behind that and how to do that effectively. Um, we had to adapt some of our teaching materials so that it will work well when people aren't in the room with you. Um, so you, know, you need to plan in time for these things. So you definitely have to be very organized. You also need to be organized in that you need to balance all of these different roles with your home life, your family life, um, you know, time for yourself to do the things that you enjoy, to stay fit, to look after yourself. Um, so I think, you know, being organized, good time management, um, planning, uh, these, these are some really, really important skills for anyone that wants to develop a portfolio career and, and thrive in it. Absolutely. And I also want to ask you, have there been any portfolio GPs who have been influential in your decision? Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I think starting back when I was doing my GP training, um, my GP trainer, um, so I, I did a quite a, a different type of training scheme in those days. It's a lot more common now, but I did what was called an uh, innovative training scheme. So instead of spending just the ST3 uh, in, in uh, GP, which was the norm in those days, I actually did my first year in general practice where I spent half the week in practice and half the week in hospital doing different specialties. Then I did a full year in hospital in the middle, and then I did a, a, a full-time GP registrar post in a different practice in my third year. So my very first year, um, my GP registrar post there, where I was half of the week in practice, my trainer was also the program director, so he was doing his educational role, but he also had previously worked in hospital in ophthalmology. And so he'd kept this sort of special interest role he was a GP with special interest, if you like, in ophthalmology. And I, I, I really liked the way that, you know, he was juggling these different skills. He was doing the teaching and doing it to a very high standard. He was a fantastic clinician, a great communicator, a really good teacher as a sort of one-to-one -one, uh, teaching that I had in my tutorials, but then also had this expertise in ophthalmology. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, and, you, you know, one of the nicest doctors I met, uh, real inspiration, in, in the way he balanced this all, um, but also he seemed really happy in his role. Uh, and I thought, you know what, that's the kind of GP I want to be. I want, I want to enjoy my clinical work, but I also want to be able to do multiple clinical roles. I want to be involved in teaching. I want to be able to do other things. So uh, another thing that uh, uh, this doctor, uh, Dr. Alistair Bennett, um, did on the side, he's a diving instructor. So something completely outside of medicine, outside of clinical, but you know, he's a diving instructor. And to this day, he runs sessions where he teaches you know new divers he takes people out you know um uh, and is involved in it and again i think having something outside of medicine is really good in terms of keeping a healthy work-life balance and, and keeping you from burning out absolutely thank you for sharing this i i think having a, a balance is definitely important and, and i'm glad you mentioned happy because many people who actually want to pursue their activities and climb up the ladder, they make a lot of sacrifices. And once they get on top, they are very miserable. Yeah, de de definitely. It it's possible um, for someone to take on too much, if you like. And, you know, if you take on too many roles, 
it could get to a point where it actually could become stressful because if you're taking on multiple roles you need to keep up to date with all of them so you need to be doing you know reading maybe going to different courses conferences um, but also it can be more time commitment so sometimes what people do is when they take on an additional role they don't cut back their main clinical role they're trying to do it on top and then it can it, it can be that they're just doing you know all their time is spent uh, doing more and more uh, work and they haven't got an outlet and and then and then you know it can lead to burnout it can lead to stress so i think it, it is important that if you're going to take on additional roles you look at if i'm going to take on this additional role do i need to cut back one of my other roles so that i'm not just you know uh, end up working more than full time you might end up working a little bit more than full time to be honest i probably do but that you know you still have time for the other things that are really important okay because if if, if you you know, for example, if I was to be doing nine clinical sessions, it would be physically impossible to do all of the other things without breaking down, you know, um, without burning out, without getting severely stressed. And so this is why, you know, actually, when I started, I was I was working full time in general practice and I was teaching the odd weekend. And then it started getting I was teaching many weekends and I get to a point where I have to decide I can't do both of these full time. It's, it's too much. And um you know, that's when I sort of made the transition where medical education became my main role and I kept my clinical role as the part-time role. And I'm glad I've done that because I'd never want to give up clinical medicine. Um, so I love to see patients. And I think that continue to engage with patients makes make, makes it that when I'm actually teaching, you know, I can relate to what people are going through, but also it means that I'm practicing what I preach. I'm using the communication skills that I'm teaching, the consultation skills that I'm teaching, the clinical knowledge that I'm teaching. I'm using it in real life practice. And it means that I can teach better and, and vice versa. That because I'm keeping up to date so I can teach, hopefully it makes me a better clinician. I love that. So yeah, you're still connected with clinical practice and you can relate to what you're training other people to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I, I I can understand what it's like for a registrar who sometimes, you know, you've got a, a patient and they've got a whole lot of complex symptoms. And sometimes, you know, we can't work out what it is. And sometimes we have to say, look, I might need to discuss this with someone or I, I need to, uh, you know, there's a few things that it could be. And, uh, you know, maybe we might wait and see or sometimes we might need to do some tests and see what comes from that and take it from there. But, you know, there, there is that dealing with medical uncertainty, which is a big part of general practice. Um, but also being able to empathize when you've had a really busy clinic and sometimes just every patient is complex and you're running late, not through any fault of your own or the patients. It just happens that way. Sometimes you end up in one clinic, four patients need admitting and you're on the phone waiting for, you know, um, someone to pick up on the other end so that you can actually hand over the details and you've got to write a letter sometimes you have a clinic where everything's straightforward and you finish on time and you know none of them need admitting uh, it's just the the way it goes sometimes isn't it you can't plan for these things sometimes absolutely you mentioned about your um, master in uh, informatic health and you also talk about the e-learning you seem very dedicated to use technology as a tool to facilitate learning can you tell us more about your work in developing e-learning program yeah, so I've, I've always been interested in computers, actually, ever since I had my uh, Amstrad CPC 464 with a little green screen when I was a little kid. Um, it was my brother's computer, actually, and, you know, I would use it whenever whenever he was off it. Um, so I've always been fascinated and I grew up playing computer games and, you know, uh, all of these things. And actually, when I was at university, one of my optional modules, uh, we called them special study modules, you know, where you could pick something that you wanted to do. I, I developed one of the first e-learning packages. It was 1999. So, you know, internet was fairly new in those days. There wasn't anything like Facebook and, you know, social media was non-existent. So I developed a package to teach uh, autoscopy and the common conditions um, and just the whole process of planning something out and developing it and building a website from scratch and learning to use new software like uh, Dreamweaver was what we used in those days. Um, it It was really really interesting and fascinating and then when i had that opportunity to do that masters if you like i was able to learn a lot more of the technical aspects and the sort of theory behind it 
and so it, it just kept that going so for example you know we've got that e-learning package on um, cancer pain management that's freely accessible to anyone cancerpain.org.uk um, we developed a, a medical typing package which is also free it's called meditype meditype.org anyone can go on there and just practice learn medical typing through a game that we developed um, so I designed it and then I found a coder to actually write the code to make the program work in the way that we sort of envisioned it. And then it went on to things like, um, you know, developing interactive learning tools to help people prepare for uh, MRCGP AKT, for example. So, you know, that there's a mixture of animated videos that we send out, uh, rapid revision uh, slides um, and then interactive questions that they can do but also for csa for example we blended things like our, our csa course we blended that there's important theory they need we're going to record those as lectures that they can see before they come so on the day with male and female simulators there's lots of practice with individual feedback which is what people will really benefit from on the day but then after they go home we'll send them some more videos to see um, some more tips some uh, animations um, and then a whole lot of cases to practice so that if you like the whole experience works together more than if you just went to a course or if you just had a book or if you just had something online it, it blends all of them together and so you know things like this it, it it takes a lot of work to develop something new like that but it's really really rewarding to see at the end of it like you know a product that you've helped to be a part of building but more importantly the feedback that we get from people that well actually you know, different people learn in different ways. So you've got some people that are very visual learners, so they benefit from like the revision cards, which have got an image and a rapid review. Some people like the animations or we've got some monomics. Some people, you know, they benefit from uh, the, the videos, actually modeling best practice. You know, I think everyone benefits from actually practicing in a realistic setting with simulators that are trained to a very high standard. So it's like the exam atmosphere and then getting individual feedback. But mixing these different things, it means that different people can benefit from it. And, and, and you know, it's really nice when you get that feedback that it really helped them to, to learn something that they found difficult to learn previously or had made a complex concept easier to understand, like, like statistics, for example. Um, uh, that That's really rewarding to see. Love that. Yeah. I have watched your YouTube animations. Um, I love the fact that you use engaging stories to actually teach the concept that you want to teach. And the use of narrative especially is very powerful because as humans, we are engaged by stories. Yeah, definitely. In general practice, and, and this is so important, isn't it? That listening to the patient's story, you know, um, uh, that's a huge part of general practice It's the small details in listening to the story that will help you pick up maybe that one small thing that they say to you in passing as part of their story that they're not that worried about but clinically to use a red flag and then you you know you you dig a bit deeper get a bit more of the history how did it start and get a little bit more information about it and it helps you to build that picture and in in that same way i think you know when when we're learning if you can take a complex uh, concept. So for example, when we teach statistics, one of the things we try to do is for the, some of the complex things, we try to break it down into a case study so that people can actually visualize it and uh, makes it easier to understand sometimes. So, but also when you attach a concept to a story, it makes it easier to remember. So, um, you know, in terms of long-term memory, it's very useful then that it doesn't just something that you've learned and then you forget the next day. When you're in the exam and you're under pressure, you remember the story, it's easier to remember the concept and that, that can help to pick up some extra mark. If you enjoyed part one of this episode, make sure you listen to part two, where Dr. Mahiba and I go granular. We talk about how to design a successful portfolio career, common mistakes to avoid, and how to play the long game.